Hello, everyone. Uh, a very good morning or afternoon to you, depending on where you're joining from today. Uh, I hope you're all staying safe and healthy. I'm Sairam from Manage Engine, and I'll be the co-host for today's webinar. Joining me are Harshita, Murli, and some of my colleagues from our team to help us organize this webinar. Uh, but before we start, we thought of bringing to you what Manage Engine is all about. Manage Engine is the enterprise IT management division of Zoho Corporation. Uh, we craft the industry's broadest suite of IT management solutions, offering more than 100 products and free tools. Uh, our on-premises and cloud solutions power the IT of 180,000 companies around the world, uh, including nine of every 10 Fortune 100 companies. Uh, and interestingly, this year we are celebrating 20 years of Manage Engine. Uh, so that's 20 years of delivering value and 20 years of delighting customers. All right, so let's get the ball rolling on today's webinar. A uh, couple of uh, information before we start. Uh, as an attendee, you will see a panel to the right of your screen. Uh, it gives you the option of asking us a question, downloading handouts, and participating in a chat. Uh, we'll try our best and answer all your questions in the session itself. However, if we are running short of time, our experts will get back to you with answers via email. Uh, if you face any issues in viewing the presentation or listening to the audio, kindly refresh the browser and try again. Uh, if that does not work, please let us know through the chat section and we'll sort it out at the earliest. All right, uh, so on that note, we'll start the session. Uh, this session is going to be a very interesting one. It's on the changing phase of service management in a world of hybrid work. And it is with great pleasure that I introduce you, speaker for our session, Charles Araujo. Charles is an industry analyst, author of three books, and an internationally recognized authority on the digital experience, uh, the, the digital enterprise, and the future of work. Charles, we are very happy to have you here. Uh, the stage is all yours. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here with all of you and uh, to talk about this, this fascinating and interesting topic. And I want to start with a couple little caveats. The first is I recognize that we have probably both managers of service desks and, and service management managers, as well as just in general IT professionals. And so I'm going to try to talk about this idea in sort of both contexts. Secondly, this is, I just, I guess I just need to warn you, this is sort of a fluffy topic. This is, and I don't mean fluffy as in like not important, but, but fluffy as in it's extremely fluid. I mean, I, I know that sometimes we want these simple, straightforward answers. This is what's happening. Do this. And it's probably not going to be like that. In fact, I'd really prefer that you think of this more as a, as a conversation that we're having together, uh, albeit with, you know, this this annoying person who talks too much apparently, but, but I want to have this as a conversation. We're going to try to get through this um, quickly enough that we have some time to actually have this conversation about exactly what is happening, because I think it's going to really be up to you to understand how to put all these pieces together in a way that makes sense. So with that, let me switch over here so I've got control, and we're going to go ahead and dive into what's going on. And, and we got to start right here, because in case you missed it, in case you just somehow slept through the last couple of years, this has been a period of crazy change. The world sort of just on a dime shut down and everything changed. But that said, I actually think that it's an interesting dilemma or an interesting point of view in so far as I actually don't buy. I mean, there's all these pundits that we're saying at the beginning of all this that we saw three years of transformation in three months and all of that. And while it is clear we saw a lot of change, I'm going to argue that it wasn't in fact transformation, not in the truest sense, because what it really did is it accelerated a lot of things that were already happening and just sort of cleared away some of the barriers to get them done. But it did usher us into what I'm calling the era of hybrid work. But the challenge is over the last, oh, I don't know, few months, as we've started to actually see the real possibility of offices opening up again and, and what have you, that people are using the term, in my opinion, my very humble, humble opinion, incorrectly, that they are meaning it to be the wrong thing. And that's what I'm, we're going to spend some time talking about, what I think we're actually talking about 
when we talk about hybrid work. But the reason I said that this period wasn't perhaps as transformative as people made it out to be is sort of a cautionary tale or a warning because I think you need to brace yourself. The big changes are still to come. And if you've heard me speak or if you've um, followed my work at all, you know, one of my jokes is that people, when I wrote my first book almost a decade ago, people started calling me a futurist. And I laughed about it because it was like, I have no idea what the future holds. But what I realized is that nobody does, right? So the big, the big takeaway here is the only thing we can do is prepare for an uncertain future to accept the fact that we have all of this change happening and to try to understand what's happening so that we can be prepared to adapt. And I think we're at the cusp and I think it's a sort of lull where we've come out of this pandemic or hopefully are coming out of this pandemic and all this change has happened and people are going, oh, it's going to go back to normal. And I think it's the exact opposite. I think we are on the cusp of massive, massive shifts that are going to change everything about how we work. And so it's important to understand what that is. So that's what I'm going to try to spend some time talking about. I encourage you to put questions in as you think about them. Uh, I'm not sure I can work the technology enough to go and and pull them up while we're talking, but I want to have a conversation about this. I want to know what you think and how you're seeing this play out so that together we can start preparing for this future. So what if, if, if hybrid work, if I think people are talking about it incorrectly, then what is it really? What are we talking about then if hybrid work is not what people are saying? Well, let's start with what people are saying. People are talking about that hybrid work simply means that we're sometimes working from home and sometimes we're working from the office. And while I think that's part of it, it is a gross oversimplification that hybrid work is not just about the where. In fact, I would argue that the where is the least important part of this process. And that what it really is, is it's about the how. In fact, so there, so there I'll, I can send some of these quotes or links to these articles if, uh, if we'd like afterward, but literally hot off the press. This is an incredibly hot topic right now. Articles are coming out every day about different aspects of this. And one of them that just came out in a publication called Future that is published by the venture capitalist firm of Andreessen Horowitz was an article called, Will the Metaverse Replace the Physical Office? And I just want to read you a couple of these quotes from it to kind of frame what I'm talking about. It says uh, one part, and what this article was, was actually talked, I think, to six or eight leaders or people that are, are specialists or focused on the future of work. And so one of the quotes was, in-person work is becoming more virtual. We're often collaborating in the cloud via multi-user apps, and it went on to name a bunch of them. Another one, hybrid workplaces are becoming the standard for work, connecting people both digitally and in person, depending on their work, on the work they are doing at that moment, Right. And a third quote, what we've seen since the onset of the pandemic and the normalization of remote work is that people want the freedom to choose how they get their work done. So what we're seeing is that this idea of hybrid work isn't about this idea of splitting between the office and home. It's about a fundamental, and this is why I say the, you, to brace yourself for what's really coming, because it's about a fundamental shift in how we work. So what does that mean? Well, I think there's six ways, and I'll walk through all of these in detail here over the next couple of minutes. And I also want to say that these are the six. Uh, there's, there's probably more. In fact, I guarantee there's more because this is an incredibly complex, uh, constantly evolving dynamic. But these six, I think, are most relevant in the context of service management. So I'll go through all these in detail in a second, but let me just run through them. Transience, more asynchronicity, more collaboration, more or increased levels of automation intelligence. And what these really result in is these two things that I think are going to be most important when we talk about the impact of service management is this idea that the complexity, complexity and the criticality is increasing when we start changing how we work. So let me go through what I mean by each of these, and then you guys can tell me if you think I'm crazy or not. So here's the first, um, this idea of transient. So, so this is the where. And the key point here is that breaking this paradigm that it's home or office. And in fact, what it really is, is that people want to work from anywhere. That location doesn't 
matter. And that's a subtle distinction, right? In fact, you know, there's these two terms that get bandied about, um, work from home, which became this acronym, the WFH thing, and then remote work, and they become synonymous. But I'd argue they're not, not entirely, because it is a mindset shift, right? If I simply have two offices, then I can sort of calcify both of those places. I can lock them down. I can make them rigid. I can make my home office an extension of my physical office if I know that I only have these two variables to work from. But if instead I'm working from anywhere, if location doesn't matter, then that dynamic changes dramatically. And so I think this is, this is really, really important for a variety of reasons, but it, the, the critical part from our perspective is service management. And I guess I should, I should pause here. I'll, well, let me finish my thought and then I, I need to come back to sort of where I'm coming from on this. But um, I, I think this idea of, of separating the physical location from our work is absolutely critical. And one of the things that we can look at is Cal Newport. He's a professor, I think, from Duke University here in the United States. Um, and he wrote an article for New Yorker magazine where he talked about, um, this was sort of near near to the beginning of the pandemic, he talked about the fact that we're going to actually see a shift, that it's not so much work from home, but work from near home. That people want the flexibility and freedom that comes with quote unquote working from home, but they also need that ability to create separation. They need the ability to create a space where they can focus. And so he turned to authors as the original work from home people that, that learned to do this. And so people like Hemingway were famous for working out of hotel rooms and other places to create this sense. One of my current heroes is a woman named Anne Hanley who writes a um, a blog and she's a sort of a marketing expert and she calls it her little house. So on her property, she's got a little bit of land, I guess, and, and about 40 feet out of her back door, she has her little house, which is her office. And she tried, you know, goes there every morning and works the, the day and then she comes back. I'm here talking to you from uh, a, a sort of cloudy and dreary day in New York City, but this is a difference for me. You can probably tell me in an office that's Battery Park behind me. And I've worked from home for 25 years. And just a few weeks ago, I decided that with all of this going on, I needed a space that I could go and function. Now, this isn't an office for my company per se. This is just a space that I come and work. And so this idea of separating physicality and location from the work becomes critical. So I, I mentioned I, I needed to pause and give you some context about myself. Well, um, the, the intro that uh, that I was given is all true. The, the one part you do need to know is that I come from an IT operations and service management background. I ran technical operations for about a billion dollar healthcare firm 25 years ago, and then spent most of my career until I wrote my book um, about 10 years ago on the buy side, advising enterprise executives, running large scale transformation programs. And a lot of that had to do with service management. I was the president of ITSMF USA and champion service management as a core approach to how we manage the work of IT. So I know the space very intimately and it's it's sort of home for me. And in the 10 years since I wrote this first book, my first book was called The Quantum Age of IT, Why Everything You Know About IT Is About to Change. It was the first of three books on sort of the future of IT and how organizations needed to adapt to that. I evolved my focus into digital transformation and then more recently on the future of work. So all of this sort of comes together and, and this talk that we're having today sort of brings all of them into one place. And so I'm very excited about that. And, and, and so I want you to know, I'm not just like, this isn't theoretical for me, that this is stuff that I've lived and I've done and I see how it's having such a big impact. Okay, so let me back to this. So it's the how. So first one is transients. What's the second? And I'm worried about my time because I keep going. I told you I talk too much. The, the second is this idea of asynchronicity. So it's not just that we want to work wherever we want. We want to work whenever we want. And this is the, so this is the thing that I've always enjoyed working from home for the last 25 years. Um, and it's something that I think most people didn't fully appreciate, that the ability to integrate your life together in different ways in whatever way made the most sense for where you're at in life. And for me, that's changed many, many times over the last couple of decades. 
that is an incredibly powerful thing. And that is that, you know, we're seeing these movements where people are sort of fighting the idea of going back to the office. And this is mostly what it's about, that they want agency. They want control over when they work. And increasingly, particularly in this knowledge economy, we can, right? We can have that flexibility because the specific timing isn't as critical in a lot of cases. Um, and what's interesting is if when the pandemic first hit, there was all of this concern, this massive concern about, oh, what was going to happen to productivity and people are going to be dealing with their kids and their pets and blah, blah, blah. And what we saw was that productivity actually increased because people were able to manage it better. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit later when we get to this about a shift in how we look at productivity because that's going to be important. But the point here is that what people therefore are looking for, if we're going to be operating in this sort of asynchronous fashion, is that they need frictionless interaction. And that's, this is a technology thing or mostly a technology thing. And so it's one of those critical elements that I think that, that is going to impact how we are shifting the delivery of services. The third... More collaboration. And, and really, you know, I put more on here, but it's almost the, the different here is, is almost more important. Another couple of interesting aspects as the pandemic wore on and we saw that, that uh, people were sort of settling into working from home or working remotely um, was, was that, A, there was a loss of some of that um, asynchronous or random interaction. But we also saw, as a result of that, higher levels of collaboration or the need for that kind of collaboration. But we also saw different, meaning that people started opting out of collaboration with people that they didn't actually need to collaborate with. That it became clear when they were focusing on their work that some of the stuff that was based on physical proximity wasn't necessary. And they started collaborating, working with people that were different than the people they worked with and collaborated with previously because that barrier had sort of fallen away and they were now able to do it. Now, again, I think we were already seeing that pre-pandemic, but it accelerated that. And so what it's led to is this need for highly dynamic, asynchronous, and on-demand ability to collaborate all at the same time. So there's a whole bunch, uh, you know, Manage Engine is owned by Zoho. Zoho has both um, Click and Connect, and they now have components where you can immediately, when you're interacting with somebody, create a video call or an audio call with them to interact. Slack recently introduced their product called or their version of that called Huddles, right? So we're seeing this where people are recognizing that on the one hand, we need that asynchronicity. On the other hand, we need the ability to instantly connect with people that we need to work with. And so the key here is we need flexibility and adaptability. And as that quote that I was reading from Future earlier talked about is that this doesn't limit, it's not limited to when we're working from home. We need that regardless of where we're working from because the dynamics have changed because we don't know where anyone is working at any given time. And so this is a pretty fundamental element to this. And what it actually leads to then is this idea of the automation and intelligence becoming a incredibly important part of this process. So on the business process side, what we're seeing is that, and, and, and I would argue that this is something that's really been happening in parallel all right. I don't think this was driven by the pandemic or by the work from home or work remote movement as much as it was that this, these technologies just have evolved over the last few years to the point that they're now being infused and it's now intersecting with this other trend. So, But what we're seeing is that the, the application of various forms of automation, things like RPA, uh, the various forms of digital process automation, and they all go by different terms, but I have, I've written several pieces on, on all the different elements of automation that we're seeing and how they're all being sort of uh, uh, muddied up. They're all just being mixed together. But in other case, all these different forms of automation, um, things like low-code platforms, and as well as things like conversational AI and different forms of machine learning that are being infused into the business processes themselves. Now, why that's important from a service management perspective is it is fundamentally changing the processes that are driving the work that people are doing. And that means that it's going to force a change in how IT delivers services to support those. So it's one of these sort of uh, runs alongside, it's just, like I said, this parallel thing, but it is going to have a dramatic impact. And it's, and it's interconnected with this 
um, remote work and work from home because suddenly we're finding that the use of automation intelligence can enable some things that otherwise would have been very, very difficult to do. Contact centers are a classic example of that. Had this pandemic hit a decade ago, we would have had an incredibly difficult time managing contact centers in the way that, that most organizations were able to pivot and do because of the levels of automation and intelligence they could then apply. The, what is this, fifth? Yeah, I'm almost there. Um, what does this all mean? Well, I think what's interesting about this is that it, it results in a increased level of, of criticality of the technology that people are using. When you're working, whenever, however, um, wherever you want, that laptop or the technology you're using to do that work is your connection. It's your lifeblood. And it, we, are, we have become much more dependent on the technology than we ever were before. And what that really means is things that weren't that critical just a couple of years ago now are. Everything is critical because literally we're taking entire categories of people out of work if that technology isn't working. So it's Death, you know, definitely more critical on an individual side, but the business process support is is absolutely more critical because it is much harder to implement workarounds when everyone is dispersed and they're working whenever. And then the last little piece of this, in the terms of the shift, is is and I'm not sure, you know, I put greater complexity because it's I don't even know how to explain this exactly. But what this really comes down to is that whenever we when we put people out and they're working from home or they're working remotely. The natural state is they became more self-sufficient. They just had to be, right? They, they didn't want to have to be reliant. And so it's been, again, this interesting dynamic that we've seen play out in some of the data in terms of the type of calls people are getting. And I'm really curious for those of you that are running service desks or running service management teams if you're seeing this. But what, what I've heard and seen is that what we're what is happening is that because our consumers are becoming more self-sufficient, there's less low-hanging fruit. There are the, the easy stuff that would sometimes be, you know, get a call in now is it getting handled independently on their own, either through self-service or just they're figuring it out. Um, and so what that means is that the demands, because the combination of the criticality and that they're only calling in or only asking for support for things that they cannot do, that the, the level of demand, both in terms of volume, but more importantly on the complexity of that demand, is increasing. So that's the gist of what I think all of this means. And like I said, there's, there's definitely other elements from a leadership, from, a, collab, from a, a community standpoint. There's a bunch of other dynamics from a cultural side. But I think those are the parts that are salient when we talk about the impact on service management. So what is that impact, right? How does this actually apply? Well, I think that there's um, five ways, and, and I want to say if you are a <laughs> cynical, jaded service management guy like me, <laughs> you might be looking at these as you read through these bullets and go, yeah, there's nothing new here. And I agree. These are not new. These are things that I would argue have been underway for a long time in service management and, and things that, that you know certainly I've been championing for and others have been championing for. I think the difference here is it used to be this was the icing on the cake. This was the cherry on top. This was the the things that separated those that were knocking it out of the park and truly transforming organizations from a service management perspective and those that were just sort of getting by and going through the motions. But now, because of everything that we just went through, these five elements are becoming critical and this last one is maybe the one that's a little bit new. The whole idea of the talent war and the role that service management plays in it is something that is, you know, really only the last year or two that this has become a significant factor. So let me go through these and and kind of explain what I mean. And then we'll wrap this up to talk about, you know, kind of like the, the call to arms. What is it that as a service management team, as a leader, as a IT professional, you should be doing to respond to all of this? So the, the first big impact that I see, and I think this is actually probably the biggest, although I'll probably contradict myself in a second. Um, the first is this idea of omni-channel or channelists that, and I don't know if you've heard these terms, they're, they're both actually coming out of um, retail for the most part, but they've been, they've been adopted by other sectors. And I think, you know, 
there's this debate right now going on about is channel is something more than omni-channel and blah, blah, blah. I don't care. It doesn't matter what you call it. Here, here's the gist of it. The gist of it is, is that customers want service wherever they are, right? So we've already talked about the fact that they want to work wherever, whenever, however, and that means they expect you to meet them there. So if they're doing all of that and then you're demanding that they follow a single path to get support, to access services, then that's going to create friction. Remember, one of the things I talked about is they want frictionless interactions. That's going to create friction. So this is now about opening this up and truly being expansive to say, how can we meet our customer? And, and I mean that in the broad term. So that could be an employee. That could be an actual customer. It could be a partner. Whoever you are serving, how can you meet them wherever they are? And I think that this is something that it used to be you know, the nice to have. But now this is going to be a critical requirement and it comes with a layer of complexity because when you open up those doors and when you allow people to interact however, whenever they want, then the continuity across channels becomes critical. You do not want to create a situation where somebody is interacting on one channel and they switch channels for whatever reason because, again, they can work however, whenever they want. And now suddenly they have to start this process again. So I think it's going to put tremendous pressure on service management. And, and as someone who sort of fought this for years within the service management community, the, the biggest challenge here is fighting the rigidity, right? That we want to have these highly structured processes that, that are highly prescriptive. Do this, do this, do that. And, and this type of an approach, this need to be omnichannel or channelist, whatever term you want to use, is going to break that paradigm. It's going to force you to create high, high levels of flexibility. And with that, the other element here is that context becomes all critical. So it's not enough to simply create continuity amongst channels or through channels. But if I'm the customer, and by the way, part of this is, is that consumer technology companies have spoiled all of us across all of these dimensions, right? So we're used to the best of consumer tech companies doing all of these things. And so we, we want it internally as well. And so if I'm calling up or if I'm sending, however I'm interacting, however I choose to interact, to the extent that I'm authenticating and you know who I am, then you shouldn't have to ask me anything. Now, again, this is nothing new from a service management perspective, but the stakes are just getting higher because I'm dependent on the technology, because I'm working asynchronously, because I'm looking and demanding that frictionless interaction you need to be aggressively looking at how you remove anything that creates friction. So knowing your customer, knowing your environment, and hopefully applying some of the, you know, cobbler's children stuff, apply some of this AI and machine learning technology to be able to predict the challenges they're facing, to be able to anticipate what problems they might be encountering so that you can solve them in advance, ideally before they've ever had to contact you, but at least be able to respond immediately once they have and not having to start this over. So I think this, this becomes a foundational sort of thing. With that, and this one's almost ironic or contradictory, but in this world of asynchronous work, we actually need highly synchronous or real-time support because I'm working whenever, however, wherever. When something breaks, when something isn't working, or when I just need something more, I need it right now. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's one of these sort of weird contradictions that while the work is becoming more asynchronous, the support and the need to provide services to, to help your teams do that work becomes more real time. Now, that is a lot, right? As someone who ran IT, 25 years ago and have watched has, has watched the complexity increase exponentially ever since. I know how hard that is. So when you can't, when there are limitations for any number of reasons, the transparent the transparency and communication into that becomes all important. So again, this is not this is this is a best practice, right? This is something that we always should have been doing in service management, but now the stakes are getting absolutely critical. And so the question is, well, what do you do with this? And I think, you know, the simple rule here, the simple answer is you got to start innovating. 
And I'm speaking specifically to the service management folks on this call, the folks that you know have drank the service management, the ITIL Kool-Aid. It can be a crutch. It can be, you know, we can have these long lasting debates on, you know, is it an incident? Is it a service request? Is it a problem? Is it blah, blah, blah? And look, at, I get that they're important. I'm not trying to diminish any of that. But don't lose sight of the fact that all of it exists for one reason, to help our customers do their job better, more seamlessly, with fewer interruptions, with less friction. And so you need to be asking yourself with every single thing you do, with every single policy you put in place, with every process you use, with every technology you implement, is this going to help me serve my customer better? And to not use processes and policies as a crutch that locks you into, well, this is how you have to work. Because that's in this last slide that we're going to get to, that's just not going to cut it. And, you know, I mentioned the cobbler's children, you know, the parable, the cobbler's children had no shoes. Well, this is the space where I think the time is, we're absolutely there, that IT organizations have to innovate. We have to adopt some of these same technologies that apply automation, apply intelligence to start surfacing this, to make this delivery of service better across multiple channels, across multiple mechanisms, right? Our goal here is what I call ambient service, meaning that our customers are using this technology and it's working and they're getting support and they almost don't even notice. It's just sort of floating in the air around them. It's like the light shining on their face, you know, and they're smiling. Yay. That's what we're going for. And if you were resorting to, well, this is our process or our policy doesn't allow, and I, and I get the reasons for it and I'm not, you know, I'm not being Pollyanna here. But I'm just saying we need to always be asking ourselves, how can we innovate to meet the customer where they are in this new era of hybrid work? And the reason that becomes absolutely essential is that your organizations are in an absolute full-on war for talent. It is getting harder and harder and harder to recruit. And after you've recruited them, retain the best talent. And while I do not subscribe to this idea that Every enterprise is now a technology company. I do believe that technology is a core driver of differentiation and value for every enterprise, which means the ability to, to, to get and retain people that understand that technology. And it's not just technologists that can apply it, right? So this is in marketing. This is in sales. This is in operations. This is in every unit of your organization. We need the best people. You need the best people. That, that can apply technology to create competitive advantage, to transform the customer and employee experience. And so much of that is going to be driven by what you do. Services and support, the practice of service management is one of the frontline components that delivers and realizes the employee experience. And when it comes specifically to employee retention, the employee experience is everything. So that's the big challenge of why I think all of this, while it's fuzzy, because in some ways it hasn't changed that much, I think what we're really talking about is the stakes have changed. The nature of what is happening has changed. And so the question as I kind of come to my, my end here is, well, how do you prepare for this future? What does this mean? And I think there's there's three things that you have to do. The first is, you know, they, they say if you're an addict, you have to accept that you have a problem. The, the first is you have to accept that this is happening. There, there is no putting this genie back in the bottle. There's no going back. It is an evolution. As we talked about, this has already been going on for some time, and it's not going to stop. If you've been laboring under the idea that things are going to, quote, unquote, go back to normal, it won't. Even if your company brings everyone back into the office, I promise you how they work, even in that office, will have changed. And it's going to force you to adapt in the ways that we've been talking about. So particularly if you're a leader here, you need to be leading this charge. You need to recognize that this is happening and you need to get ahead of it. The second thing, and I've been saying this for a decade, probably longer, 
is you have to get into your customer's shoes. This becomes absolutely essential. I, I remember I did a project, I won't name it, but for a very large US federal agency, I was running a transformation program. It was, I don't know, it was thousands of people um, that were impacted by this. And so as a result, I was traveling to Washington, DC um, for about a week every three weeks. And I stayed at the same hotel and I had the opportunity being there that I met the general manager of the hotel I stayed at. And we had a shared love of wine and and so we would get together and he'd bring a bottle of wine, always love free wine. And, and we'd talk about things. Well, he learned eventually what I did. And after a few glasses of wine where he loosened up a little bit, he says, Charlie, if IT would just come and spend one day with me in my hotel, they would understand how what they do impacts my ability to serve my guests. And I've heard versions of that from executives, from business executives all over the world that the most important thing you can do if you're going to start transforming how you deliver services and the work you do is to get in front of your customers. Get in front of the people that are using the services you're delivering, the support you're providing, and understand how they're interacting with this technology. And let that be what guides you as you move forward. And the last thing is, and, and for you service management folks that are dyed in the wool like me, this is going to be probably the hardest. Service management, like almost all of IT, has been rooted throughout its history in this idea that we leverage technology, we leverage process to drive efficiency. Now, efficiency is still important, but what we really have to be focused on is shifting that focus to the experience. And this, this is both the customer and the employee experience. I think from a service management perspective, it's mostly the employee experience. But in either case, it's about making that shift. And, and it becomes what I call a true north process, meaning that we have to hold the experience up as the thing that guides our efforts, as the thing that, that drives the decisions that we make. Because when you do that, it's really, you know, I mentioned that I can't really be prescriptive. I can't say do these five things and everything is going to be fine. And that's because this idea of what is a good experience is ephemeral. It's constantly changing. And so it's really about holding that up and creating a picture of what that looks like and then adapting it as you go. Now, one of the things I want to speak quickly here to the, the leaders, if you lead a service desk or if you lead a service management team, one of the, the articles also from uh, Future uh, by Andreessen Horowitz uh, was talking about on workplace productivity. And it was, it was talking about the fact that in this era of change, as we go enter this era of hybrid work, that how we look at productivity has to shift. So I'm going to read this quote to you. It says, a more holistic framework for productivity, one that reveals a fuller picture, must include several dimensions, including satisfaction and well-being, performance, activity, communication, collaboration, efficiency, and flow. And they boil all that down to this acronym of SPACE, which stands for Satisfaction, Performance, Activity, Communication, Collaboration, and Efficiency. And so, and I, I bring this out because when we talk about shifting from efficiency to experience, that doesn't mean efficiency is not important, but it means that as we're managing our teams, it has to be just one dimension. As we architect the services we provide, it has to be just one dimension. And the overarching one has to be experience, but you can't just go say it. You're going to have to change your management models. You're going to have to change how you measure the performance of your service management teams and your support teams so that you're getting the outcome that you want. And my last little piece that I'll give you is from an article in the MIT Sloan Management Review called The Future of Team Leadership is Multimodal. And it talks about that in this era of change, that as our workers and our teammates are dispersed, working whenever, however, um, I lost it, whenever, wherever, however they want, that as a leader, your role changes. And I think this may be no more important than in the service management space when all these pieces come together. And I'll let you read the article. I'll, I'll put a link here. But um, in it talks about that the four leaders that the four roles, rather, that leaders need to play as they adapt to managing in this hybrid, uh, hybrid era of hybrid work, or what they call the hybrid workforce, is the conductor, the coach, the catalyst, and the champion. And I think most of those are very intuitive, but what it really means is getting out there and leading your team in a space. So they, I think this ties together with this idea of productivity because it's about guiding your team 
to this future. Because as I said at the beginning, I think that we are only at the very, very beginnings of seeing exactly how dramatic these changes are going to be. And I think your ability to shift the way you deliver services, the service management practice, is going to be a huge factor in the ultimate success of your organization as we come through this period. So with that, um, Gender, I want to bring you back and we can have a conversation about it. I, I, I'm very curious to see if people think I'm absolutely nuts because it happens all the time <laughs> um, and see what people thought. So I will bring it back to you. All right. Uh, thank you, Charles. Uh, that was an insightful session where you shared some trends driving the shift towards hybrid work and how IT service management teams can embrace and adapt to it. For our next section, joining us today is Gendra John, who is a product expert from our ITSM solution, Service Desk Plus. He will be giving you an introduction to Service Desk Plus and also discuss with Charles some of the challenges faced in the ITSM field. Feel free to keep your questions coming. John and Charles will try to answer all your questions towards the end of the session. Over to you, John. Thank you, Saram, and uh, thank, thank you, Charles, Charles, as well. There was a very interesting session where we learned right, uh, over the past two years, things have really changed for organizations around the world, right? So at first, everybody was forced to move to a remote um, a remote model, right? Pretty much uh, government sanctioned people to go back home. And then now we see how hybrid work is taking over, right? So we have people coming into office and working from home as well. And like you said, right, there are people who are working from many different places. It's not just home and from office. And as an IT service desk or ITSM, right, like when we are trying to support our employees, we need to change as well. So I thought we'd just uh, discuss a few uh, topics right now, Charles, if that's OK with you. So um, just a couple of questions. So how do you think service desk can improve engagement and customer experience in a hybrid model? I think the most important thing when we think about what it, how does this actually play out on the ground? Um, and I talked about being in, in your customer's shoes, but, but and maybe the, the best way to think of that is this idea of empathy, right? How do, and, and you know, for, I'd actually be curious to know um, how many people here that are working either on a service desk or in a service management team are actually also working from home because I suspect it's a lot. So empathy should be easy, right? Because we're all sort of in that space. Um, but I think it's critical. It's, it's recognizing that we're kind of all in it together and and you know I, I I almost struggle with that answer because I know it's it sounds it sounds like one of these fluffy things, but it is so so important is just recognizing that how difficult of a situation this is. I I'll give you an example. I was talking to a um, a, a consultant, I guess, um, working for a a company that does business process management kind of uh, work, and he gave this example of the moving process, right? So we think about business processes. And and he says, he's saying, well, if you're a moving company, you're it's tempting to say that the moving process is I show up, I load all the stuff in the truck, I drive it to the new location, I unload it, and that that's the process. But the actual process from the customer's point of view starts when they decide they need to move and they find a location and they find the, the whole, you know, and it, it ends when they're sitting in, as he said, their lazy boy watching TV at the end of the move, eating a slice of pizza or whatever, because it's done. Now, that's not to say that this moving company can affect all of that. But having empathy to recognize that that is the entirety of the process, acknowledging it, and, you know, simple things like you finish and you put the chair and deliver a slice of pizza. Right. And say, here you go. Welcome to your new home. Let us bring you your first meal. These simple little things, you know, Zappos um, prior to their acquisition by Amazon was famous for these kinds of things where they would interact with customers in ways that had nothing to do with the actual service they are providing. They sold shoes. Um, and so that level of empathy can go so far. One of the reasons I'm such an advocate for getting out, you know, getting from behind your desk and going to where people are working. And and by the way, I think that's just as feasible now in a remote work. Go to wherever they're remote working, wherever they happen to be, and sit with them. The reason that's so important is because of that empathy. 
just the mere fact of showing up. I was talking to the CIO um, not too long ago, and he said that uh, one of the first things that he did when he started this new job is he went on a tour of every, and they had like you know 80 offices. It took him a year and a half, but he went to every single office and met with them and just, and, and for, he said something like 75% of them is the first time they'd ever seen anybody from IT show up at the place. Okay. And it just changed the dynamic because you're listening and you're, you're engaging. And so um, when we talk about hybrid work, it's, it's about acknowledging the fact that it is in fact changing and shifting and that we need to be empathetic with it so that we can adapt. And by coming in with that humility, it starts changing the nature of how we interact with our customer. Okay, okay. Yeah, that was a great explanation. So basically, it's a very cultural shift, right? Like moving to a more empathetic uh, way of approaching our um, customers, right? Our end users who are reaching out to us. And yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks for that, Charles. So moving on to another question. So how can IT departments support these new ways of working? So we were just talking about how now there are multiple different ways uh, through which people work from, right? So how can an IT department or an IT service desk equip themselves to um, support these new ways of working? Yeah, so th this is probably going to be the hardest one, I think, for most service management professionals and IT departments to sort of deal with because... Uh, well, let me give you my short answer, and then I'll explain it. The short answer is flexibility. I talked about breaking through the rigidity okay. of, hey, this is what the process is, these highly prescriptive elements. Um, and I think that's absolutely critical. It's, it's about allowing people to work however they want. The challenge, of course, having been an IT person for my entire career, I get this, is that when stuff breaks... <laughs> When it doesn't work, when there is some kind of an issue, well, we're the ones holding the bag, right? So the natural tendency is to lock things down. When I was running these large-scale transformation programs and people would talk about the need for change management and da-da-da, and I'd say, yeah. look, it, I can guarantee you that we never have an outage caused by a change. It's very simple. Don't make any changes. But, of course, that's the exact opposite of what we need to do, right? We, we actually, the purpose of change management, just to pick on that, is to enable change. In fact, to enable as much change as possible as fast as we can. Um, and so it's about this mindset shift to say, how do you break down these rigid structures to focus on delivering both the employee experience as well as the service experience that people need to get their job done, to do what they need to do? And so the, these, the last, you know, the last question, this one sort of feed off one another because it, the, the striking that balance point requires listening, requires understanding what is actually affecting your customers in a way that is meaningful, that actually makes a difference. Because, and again, I'm very, I am very empathetic on this front because I've, I've lived this. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll share a fun story here in one second. Um, Sometimes what the customer wants isn't reasonable. I'm not suggesting that we do anything they want, right? I am suggesting, though, that we also don't compound it by simply trying to get everyone to do what we want. It's about listening authentically to identify what is the real issue that we're trying to solve. And there. so my, my quick story to this point, um, this is... 25 years ago, back when I was running IT, I had this customer. She ran, so I told you it was a healthcare firm. So we were fairly large. We're, like I said, about a billion dollars. We had um, several hospitals and uh, 60, 70 clinics around the Southern California where I lived at the time. And she was responsible for the business office, which is one of our larger departments that was non-clinical. So all the finance, all of that kind of stuff. And she was never happy. I mean, she wanted just the world, right? It didn't matter what we did. It was never good enough. And so it became this balancing act of trying to listen, to be attentive, to figure out how we could meet her needs, but also being respectful of the fact that we had to serve the entire organization. We had to deal with compliance requirements. We had to deal with you know process security and a bunch of other things. And... Yeah. Uh, we were actually very good at it. We we executed exceptionally well, and I was so frustrated. And then we eventually got acquired by this larger company. 
and I went on to become a consultant and I happened to be in a meeting that she was in after. So I no longer work for the company. And uh, <laughs> I, I get up because I realized I don't need to be in this meeting. And her name was Donna. I hear the door. I'm walking down the hall and you hear the door open and close and I hear her voice. She says, Charlie. And I turned around 15 feet away from her and I looked at her and says, I don't work here anymore. I don't have to listen to you anymore. <laughs> well, that isn't what I said. What I actually said was, yes. <laughs> right? Because I was like, oh, I don't want to get yelled at again. I'm so tired of it. And she said, I just want to tell you, I'm sorry. I never realized how good we had it. Because she's now gone through all these changes and it wasn't going yeah. so well. You know, it, it is this really fine line that you have to strike. And so I, I tell a story only to say I empathize that that sometimes yeah. being particularly in a service management role is is thankless because you have to strike that balance. Um, okay. My challenge or my caution is just to resist the desire to land on the point of this is our process, this is our policy, this is how it must be done, okay. and instead seek ways to create as much flexibility as you possibly can so that you are able to support the work and the ways that people want to work, however that might be. And it will require that you embed adaptability within your organization. It will require that you change, um, that you make your, your life a little bit harder in some ways, right? Because you're going to be supporting all these non-standard things or whatever, but it will make a world of difference. Yeah, cool. Yeah, and it ties in with the point you were telling as well, right? Get into our customer shoes so that we understand what their pain points are and so that we can, you know, be flexible and meet them at their point of need as well. So yeah, great. So yeah, moving on to the final question I have, which is, how can service desk analysts and support technicians build positive relationships remotely and collaborate better? So I'm going to answer this two ways because I'm yeah. not sure which one you're referring to, Because, but, but I think it applies okay. both. So in terms of both with yeah. the customer that you're interacting with, especially if you're like getting a phone yeah. call, um, but also within teams, because I think what yes. w the one thing that we can't miss in all of this is, is support teams are also going through this process at the same time. Not only are they having to support everyone doing this, but you are having to also adapt your own style of work. I think there's a couple of things. And again, the, the single greatest answer is community and that and you could substitute culture in there. But so if you're a team leader in particular, you need to go out of your way to get people together and have non-work conversations, the same sort of things that you would have done in a non-work environment or rather in, a, in an office type setting. Um, and there's some new tools to do this. You can certainly do it, you know, as a Zoom session. I'm not a huge fan of that. If you have the ability to actually meet in person, getting everyone together, I highly suggest it. But even if you can't, there's new technologies. Um, some of Zoho's actually technologies can be used in this way, um, where you just create a space where people can come together and have these sort of dynamic, fluid, non-work related conversations to, to get that level of interaction. The other part of it that I think is really, really important that I think is particularly difficult in a support setting is I guess the easiest way of saying this is to be you. And, and what I mean by that is the number of times that I call in and, and I'll, this is like from a customer support perspective, but I think it's the same. And you get, you get somebody who is clearly following a script and is communicating with their tone and with their energy level how much they really don't want to be doing any of this. And it creates a negative experience before I've ever started. Yeah. If I engage with somebody in any way, whether it's via email, whether it's via chat, whether it's via phone, and I allow my personality to come through, if I allow myself to be human, it's going to go back and it's going to create that empathy, including with the person I'm serving. And that does a couple of things. It makes them more comfortable. That's probably the most important thing. It makes them more comfortable, more engaged, that they're not just a cog in this machine and they have to figure out how they get past you fast enough to get someone who can actually solve this problem. Instead, they start relating to you as a person, which is all important for their experience. But frankly, it also gives you some latitude because if you're a human and you make a mistake, I'm much more inclined. We are literally programmed to... Be empathetic with that to go, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I, you're having a rough day. Let me, you know, that's okay. Take your time. You know, no, no big deal. 
And, and so allowing that, and one of the things that, one of the most positive things that have come out of this pandemic and the work from home, and, and, and I, I saw this very viscerally as someone who's worked from home for 25 years. If I was on a call like this, I was so paranoid. It's like lock the door, bolt it, you know, soundproof the room. Don't want them to be any semblance that there was a kid or a pet or anything that I, I wasn't being professional. And the pandemic sort of changed that. It's like, you know, I was meeting with CEOs that had a, had a toddler, you know, bouncing on their knee because their wife had to run to the, the store or whatever. And, and it's like we all allowed our humanity to show through. And, and so my, the big thing here is don't let go of that. Hold on to it. Allow yourself to be human in every interaction, whether internally or externally. And I think it will just continue to change that game. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, yeah, like again, right? A more cultural change where we try to be more human, be more understanding. And that just makes things a lot more easier, right? Giving our end users a good experience as well. Okay, so just one last question. So now that we're talking about being more human and right, um, so we were talking about how people are working at different times, right? They work on their own time, right? Like their own terms, basically. And as an end user, right, when I reach out to my service desk, I always expect an immediate answer, right? I always expect an immediate response. So, um, so how can service desk be more available for end users during such, uh, during very, like, very flexible times, right, for end users? So what are some ways you think service desk can change so that they are more available for uh, mm. requesters? Well, that, that may be what the hardest question you've asked because it, you know, at the end of the day, that is a, a staffing. I mean, th there's really only a couple of answers to that. You know, one is you increase the amount of investment you make in your service and support teams to be able to have more availability to more have more bandwidth. Um, and if that's not an option, then it's about how do you create bandwidth by working smarter. Um, I will say I'm not um, not uh, really a big fan of the quote unquote self-service elements. Now, don't get me wrong, self-service is critical. Like if I, I want yeah. self-service, um, I want the ability to engage on my own and solve my own problems. So that is that is critical, but let's not that's not a replacement for the interaction. So the question is, well, how do I then make that more available and you know certainly things like conversational ai agents is a huge help um you know applying you know, the multiple channels can help a lot it's a it's a whole lot easier if i'm interacting with a bunch of people on on slack or on whatsapp or different channels i can i can support multiple people at once um and then clearly things like you know the 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 tried and true stuff you know, getting your management your knowledge management system in place so that i'm not starting over every time you know so it's about working smarter rather than harder but but that is a tough one it is and i think that this is going to be a continuing challenge for organizations because as we talked about the criticality increases the complexity increases and it's going to get harder to continue to provide this level of the support so you're going to have to get smarter about how you do it yeah yeah cool yeah, that's, uh, thank you for that answer. So yeah, looks like, like you said, right, there's going to be a lot of changes for IT service desk moving forward because uh, the way we work is changing and the way people expect support is also changing. And yeah, thank you so much for the session once again, Charles. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, yeah just, just before we sign off, right, um, I just wanted to give you a brief introduction to what service desk plus is and what we do here at Manage Engine when it comes to ITSM. So let me just go ahead and share my screen real quick. I hope you guys can see it. So yeah, so basically I'm just gonna give you an introduction to what we do. Now Service Desk Plus is Manage Engine's uh, flagship full stack ITSM uh, suite. And uh, we've been in the market from 2005 and um, been used by more than 100,000 organizations worldwide. Now, Service Desk Plus is available in 37 languages, and it is also available as an on-premises or a cloud version, and it is hosted in Manage Engine-owned data centers. Now, Service Desk Plus, uh, with Service Desk Plus, we cover the entire gamut of ITSM, right? Right from your incident management, to your change management, problem management, asset management, and so on. And Service Desk Plus also comes in three different versions, which is the standard 
professional and enterprise. And since we were talking about how ITSM is changing, uh, Service Desk Plus is a great platform that you could explore to uh, streamline service management in your organization as well. And if you have any questions about how Service Desk Plus works or the different features that we have available, please do write to us and we'd be more than happy to help you out and get back to you. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks so much, John, for giving us an intro on Services, Services Plus. Plus. So, so we are ending the session right now, and uh, as soon as we end, we'll you'll be getting a feedback prompt on the screen. Please share your thoughts on how the webinar went, and uh, if you have any further questions, do drop us an email on webinars at the managerengine.com for us to address them. With that, we're signing off for today. Thank you so much for joining, and uh, have a great day. Cheers. Bye.